I like a co cold coffee. If, if in the morning there's not a cold coffee in the fridge from the day before and I'm dead, then I committed suicide. Ooh. But if there's a cold coffee in the fridge, I died accidentally because I plan for tomorrow. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Here in L.A., Los Feliz Christmas Edition. Today we chat with Billy Wyatt of E.K., the funkiest store in Los Feliz. Billy and I talk about his punk rock roots, how he started making t-shirts, his most famous t-shirt, the Happy Foot, Sad Foot sign saga, and the hell mouth that opened when it was removed. We also get into why Billy loves Verdon so much. I've wanted to sit down with Billy for years now, and we got to, and it turned out way better than I expected. So walk with me up Vermont, just past the Dresden, and join us as we wrap up Los Feliz with a bang. Okay, everybody, I am in Los Feliz in the world famous EQ with Billy. What's your last name, Billy? Wyatt. Billy Wyatt. Um... And I'm glad to be here with you. Thanks for spending some time with me. This is after hours, um, so I feel uh, fortunate to be here. Um, when I interviewed uh, uh, Lena Lucaro, who used to work here, she told me that I was pronouncing this store wrong all, all along. <laughs> yes. Is, is it normal that people call it YQ or something yeah. like that? Well, you just pronounced it wrong there, too, so... In fact, they had enough problems with the sign in the early days. Here, I'll turn on that sign. Uh huh. A neon sign. Up top, it's spelled Y-Q-U-E. Underneath it, it says E-K. So E-K is the correct way to pronounce it. Yeah, but even with a little emphasis, if you were Latino, you might say E-K. E-K. But I can't quite pronounce it right either, so I don't claim to. Uh, when did you buy EK? Uh, I took over EK around 97. And uh, let's see. A uh, woman, Tracy James, who ran it before me, was maybe the second or third owner at the time. So it had already been pretty much an institution of L.A. before I got a hold of it. And then I pretty much was trying to get out of the T-shirt business and uh, was looking for something more fun to do, and this place had a lot of eclectic, weird stuff. It's funny that you say you wanted to get out of it because I think probably the, the most famous thing that you ever sold here was uh, the Winona Ryder T-shirt, right? Well, yeah, the T-shirts just keep pulling me back in. Do you uh, screen print these yourself? Uh, we screen print them here. I don't pull the squeegee all the time myself anymore, but yes, we do have a guy, Ted, who pulls the squeegee on a regular basis and manages to keep us alive with screen printing. So this Winona Ryder t-shirt, was this your idea? Um, yeah, it's the 20th anniversary of our free Winona shirt coming up in a few days. I which, didn't know that. Yeah, December 12th, I believe, is the day of infamy for her, where she got, you know, harassed by Saks for trying on a few things in their store and that pretty much as a design popped out the night that we found out she had been arrested and that shirt pretty much uh, put us back into the t-shirt business and kept us alive as a store for quite a while because I mean 20 years ago I forgot about a lot of this story I can't believe it's been that long yes time does fly doesn't it so 20 years ago she was in Beverly Hills trying on clothes she never got arrested for this well she got arrested but was she ever convicted for this um well i think she finally um did accept a a charge but there was a trial of shoplifting on shoplifting yes and so as soon as you heard this news you were a fan of hers and so you created a shirt yeah coming to the defense what seemed like of winona was a no-brainer it's like Everybody was kind of, at the time, immediately like another celebrity. Ah, oh, look how crazy they are or how screwed up celebrities are. But at the same time, Winona can do no wrong. So, you know, it was an easy design to make and an easy, and people did 
you know, do uh, think, you know, Sax was completely off the rails for harassing her for just trying on a few things and accidentally putting them in her bag. Now, this was before the concept of something going viral existed. But the way that I remember it, that shirt kind of went viral, right? Yeah, I kind of think it's like a meme in a way now, what we call a meme. But T-shirts were memes of our of my day. And, you know, you had to make something really uh, stand out. It did coincide with, uh, I mean, the fact that the Internet and uh, it happened to be a slow news week when that came out. How, what would you describe this this kind of a, uh, of a store? Um, well... The it's just a, a place to hang out for me, but, uh, you know, a place to just where people can browse and, you know, look at stuff. Maybe they'll spend some money, but, you know, it's got a lot of nostalgia. It's got a little bit of current events. It's got a little bit of uh, knickknacks and things to maybe let them uh, buy. But generally speaking, it's just kind of a place with a bunch of stuff. Well, and, and you know that's that's a perfectly fine uh, description. Uh, I don't know if Madison Avenue would say that, but there's a lot of vintage things here. There's a lot of curious things. I would say it's impossible not to browse in this place because everywhere your eye goes, there's something more unique and cool. You've got Dollar Records over here, Dollar Vinyl. Yeah, who's got the, uh... who's got Dollar Vinyl in in L.A. Well. I think uh, the records are fun. We want to do more with that. And the uh, types of used things that the store had, I think were more interesting in the past. I think it's harder and harder to get good merchandise now because one, you know, the not as many companies in business making quirky stuff and you just can't get things and anything you can get everybody else can get online so they can just look on their phone and find it. So it's kind of, uh, not as, um, fun to say, go out and search for merchandise and know that even if you get it, everybody else is going to have it in the mall in three months. So there's not as much fun in getting that kind of stuff. But, um, the people who owned the store before me did find lots of cool vintage stuff. And there was a time when, you know, that was more uh, interest and there were great things in here that prop people would buy and mm -hmm. you could get those things. But I don't have as much luck at finding those things as the prior owners did. Well, well I mean, something that you've got that you really can't find online are these hyper local T-shirts. Um, I'm thinking about your um, your T-shirts about the neighborhoods like uh, Los Feliz with a skunk. Is that the one with the skunk? Los Feliz has a skunk, uh huh. But I think the Los Feliz shirt with the typewriter is kind of cooler because it's kind of there's a lot of writers around here. Yeah. And a lot of these things pretty much make themselves because people come in and say, you know, what they. Uh, I mean, some of them we come up with, but a lot of them I'd say are designed by committee, or they just seem humorous and they pretty much make themselves. So, the skunk, the coyote, these are kind of. They could be any neighborhood around here. Things like the L.A. River sign is kind of so generic, you don't even think about it, but it's there. But things like the Tang's Donut oh, shirt yeah. or, you know, some of the ones like the L.A. 84. I mean, a lot of these people just come in and say they really want that, and then we end up making it. So they kind of make themselves. Uh, it, it when you say by committee, is that what you mean? The, the public will come in and give you a good idea and you'll make it? Sure. Yes, exactly. It, that, again, that is something that just doesn't exist in the world. Yeah. Well, I mean, we also keep it simple. I think as some people have described it, it does not look like I tried very hard. And <laughs> I would say that's true. Um, but my printing skills kind of go back to the punk rock days. So that's kind of where... It's like uh, I've worked for big companies. I've printed hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of shirts for companies from Uniqlo to Urban Outfitters and had screen printing presses, manufactured my own shirts and things like this. But 
Uh, we make it as simple as we could do now because we just realize it's not that important to put, uh, you know, so much work just in the print because it's really just, it should be fun. Punk rock is, is a theme that's ongoing here. And I think people who aren't 20 years old appreciate that aesthetic. They appreciate the almost do-it-yourself appeal of things where the edges aren't as rounded and um, it doesn't seem as commercialized. Would you agree with that? Uh, you know, I don't know if the uh, aesthetic, um, I think it's the idea that, yes, the things you can make yourself should be cooler than things that you can, say, uh, just push a button and have printed out. When I came to L.A., I would go and down to Long Beach, and, uh, and one of the guys, uh, Human Steve, I think he's in the band called The Vandals, he had a screen printing shop down in Long Beach, and we'd be fucked up and high. We'd go down there to sober up, and then we'd screen print T-shirts, and we were like the official, unofficial screen printer for like fear and we get shirts from the goodwill store and by the end of the week we come back up with a handful of shirts and sell them outside of shows and or go to like vinyl fetish on melrose and we get money and any money made a difference we weren't doing it to make fashion or anything but that style you couldn't make it any other way the coolest shirts were the ones that were way fucked up off center maybe printed poorly and the shop was a complete plate mess when we left, but we would just escape and get back up to Hollywood. And so it's funny when you say punk rock, you actually mean it <laughs> like, like literally, you know, fear and the vandals and all that. Is that the type of music that you loved when you were younger? Yeah. I mean, I kind of came out here incidentally due to the punk rock movement. So, you know, so? I remember once scribbling a note because I was listening to Black Flag back in Florida and trying to be uh, an intern and the Dead Kennedys. I think I sent them a letter too. You wanted to be an intern with the Black Flag. Yeah, I just like, I didn't know what it meant to be an intern, but <laughs> I was inspired. Uh, what album were, were you into? Well, for just Black the standard stuff, you know, whatever. Like, like Damaged or? Uh, yeah, I mean, but the, I can't remember. The, the main, I'm trying to even remember how I even got the music because I didn't own albums. So uh, I can't even remember. But yeah, I remember. Let's see. What is it? Oh, we would be at the club, you know, like like it was a mix. I mean, punk rock was kind of neat back then because it was mixed with new wave. Yep. And the so you had hot chicks hanging out for dancing and the new wave kind of groove. And then you had the macho kind of guys hanging out with the punk rock. And it was just kind of so most of my exposure kind of came from clubs down in florida where there was a, a mix and bad brains with if they if some band came through town it was the biggest thing on earth but there still was only like 20 people that knew about it <laughs> and uh you know so that was kind of it and then coming a lot of those people ended up migrating at the same time that i was going to come out to california for going to school and i just ended up in hollywood and accidentally and then learned to screen print Took me six months to learn how to make a screen, but I did it. And once you've learned, you've never stopped. Well, yeah, it's kind of um, the, uh, but that's the hard part is just making the screens. Would it take a normal person like me uh, six months to learn this too? No, they got YouTube now. Oh, so you were really just learning on your own. Nobody, nobody. Well, I, like I said, I went down there and I stood around and helped screen print t-shirts with the punk rockers here in LA down in Long Beach but then I walked around and talked like I knew how to print t-shirts until someone <laughs> gave me a job then I realized I didn't know shit and it took me six months to make the screen this we're talking late 80s or I'm sorry late 70s early 80s early 80s early 80s and um I don't see a lot of literal punk rock in the store is is there uh, I don't live by I mean I think there's one thing about punk rock it's like uh, a lot of people live in the past like the nostalgia of it and you know punk rock should have been dead years ago <laughs> it was never meant to last you don't think fuck it that shit <laughs> i mean people walk around playing the same kind of music like they did in the 80s and it was like the whole idea was to destroy music not to fucking do the same thing over and over i mean what's the point then it's like then you're just practicing instruments it's not a 
It's not creative or new to keep doing the same shit over and over. So, 2019, you hear that the happy, by the way, the happy foot, sad foot sign for a lot of people in this area was something that would tell them whether or not they were going to have a good day. If, if they were driving down Sunset and they passed this sign um, and the happy foot was, the, was this, the image that they would get, it was a revolving sign, then they th- would think, oh, great, I'm going to have a good day. If it was the sad foot sign, they'd be like, oh, crap, I'm going to have a crappy day. Well, that's the kitschy way to transfer the fact that it was a holding place for the spiritual depth of the entire region. And the fact is that it was a blocking, a portal, a hell mouth of destruction. And that sign simply could be interpreted by its good luck and bad luck. But the reality is it was blocking the portal of hell being released on this earth. The sign was blocking the portal. Yes. And when the sign was taken down, because the Dodgers there... did not win the World Series that year, COVID came upon us, the economy collapsed. The, the capital was. Uh... I tried to tell people beforehand, but they wouldn't listen. How did they you... wanted to hear the story about the happy foot and the sad foot. And it's so pretty and it tells me my fortune. But the truth is, the dark underworld has been released upon us. We will never be the same. I don't know if you're kidding or not. I wasn't kidding then. I'm not kidding now. In 2019, do you remember what month this was? Like September? Yes. September of 2019. Um... You hear that this sign is being taken away. Well, how how did you find out about this? uh, In May, a couple of customers wandered in and we do already did already have the T-shirts for the Happy Foot, Sad Foot and had been selling them for a long time. And a couple of young ladies said, hey, we heard the uh, foot doctor might be moving and the sign may be coming down. And then we're like, oh, my God. We may have already had our spinning wheel with the happy foot, sad foot stickers. I'm not sure, but we decided we needed to investigate. And, you know, over the months, we did just, you know, kept tabs on what was happening. And there was an effort to save the sign and keep it where, you know, was. And we provided some shirts for that and did what we could. We lit candles under the sign and they were removed. We put, I uh, tried to, you know, make a display of shoes, you know, like only one of a kind shoes. Like you can't throw two shoes because if you got either, you know, usually a foot error. So we tried to create like shrines and bring attention to it. And the neighborhood was in support of trying to save the sign where it was. But then one day we got the news that the sign could not be, uh, made a historical monument because it's just a plastic sign and that uh, it, the, because the business itself was also moving, that they couldn't preserve it as a historical monument. Well, at that point, uh, the discussion shifted to um, what's going to happen then. And since no one really had communication with the property owners who were laying low on this issue, um, the... I had mentioned that it could come here. I'd be more than happy to, but some other people also maybe wanted to house it. And uh, when I did mention it, I think, to the foot doctor, he wasn't against it. So I decided to just go down and measure it one day and pick up a sandwich down at uh, Tropical because I hadn't been down there in a while. But I used to live on Benton, and it seems like everybody in L.A. at one time lived on Benton (laughs) or Benton and Sunset. And... uh, the uh, so I drove down there one day just to figure OK, I better go check the dimensions because the dimensions seemed a little too big for getting it into the store. Mm-hmm. And on that particular day, when I got there, there was a truck outside that was about to obviously remove it. And so that's when, you know, 
uh, I that was unannounced. I tried to contact people, put it up on the internet, etc., and pretty much just uh, stayed there until we could resolve uh, what was really going to happen to the sign. So you see these two guys in a truck. One guy and his wife. Did you did you yell at them and say you can't take that? I just tried to find out information about what was going on, and nobody would say anything. And then I went and looked for the owners of the hotel, and they weren't around. And then I uh, gave them numbers, and, I, and then I tried to call the foot doctor, and I put it up on Twitter or whatever, because then the guy... My main concern at that point, because I removed my sign recently in front of EK, which came from that same period of time, possibly, and it fell apart in my hands as I took it out of the plastic holder. So my first concern was that this one person could not safely remove this sign. Therefore, and no one knew that was involved with trying to save the sign that it was being taken down that day. So my main purpose was to first just find out, you know, this one guy can't take this sign down. It's going to break into pieces, and people should know about this. So that was my main thing, was just to figure out how to bring attention to the fact that it somebody's here about to take the sign down. And so uh, you put out the, the, the alert. Did, the guy, did that scare away the guy and his wife? No. They called the cops. They then, called the cops on you? Yeah. And then uh, he started putting up tape. But the main thing was, is the foot doctor, they picked the day that the foot doctor normally works up in the valley. So he wasn't around. And that was like Thursday, I think. And um, so I couldn't even get in touch with him because he does his calls in the hospital or something. And the property owners were not to be found. And this guy claimed he worked for the property owners. But then he wouldn't say who he worked for. There was no name on the truck. Nobody would say anything. So, you know, I pretty much just stayed there until uh the property owners showed up and they then and i did finally get the foot doctor on the phone yeah negotiations ensued so the the property owners show up they 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 somehow decide that it's okay to come out of their hiding area and they start talking to you how do you convince them to let you have this well well first we have a debate about real estate which is the sidewalk private property or not and i'm like not yours i can stay here as long as i want so uh wow the slowly as i they say well who are you like, well, who are you because nobody would admit to being any responsibility for anything they so finally they were patels the patels the First guy, so what are you? Are you who do you own this place? They go, yeah. I said, what's your name? Patel. And then what's the second guy's name? I'm Patel. I said, what are you? Are you Patel? Said, yeah, Patel. So it was the Patel brothers. It remind me of like the Big Lebowski or something, fighting over the rug or trying to get your rug back. <laughs> but also, uh, what? But there, I mean, they, I simply think, wanted to get rid of this thing because they wanted their real estate back and too many people cared about the sign. They didn't necessarily care about the sign, but they just wanted their real estate back, which is where the sign was. Protecting the fucking hell mouth. <laughs> but they should have appreciated that you wanted to take the sign too. I wasn't trying to take the sign. I mean, I was just there to keep it from being removed and being broken. I did, and I accidentally happened to be there that day, and it just happened to be that I knew enough about what was going on that, you know, it shouldn't come down was the main point. It, it shouldn't come down the way it was coming down because it would be broken. Well, that, but also no one knew about it. Everybody that was involved with saving the sign, nobody knew about it that particular day. So how did it, how did it end up in your hands? Well, at that point, with the uh, I wouldn't move. They wanted the sign to come down. I got the foot doctor finally on the phone and a few other people 
that were involved with trying to, I don't know, to use Twitter or fucking Instagram. I mean, how many things can you do at one time when you're in the middle of a protest? It's like, okay, do you twit this or do you Instagram it? Do you Facebook it or do you send an, inst you know, send an email spam? I don't know. <laughs> so I'm sitting there trying to figure out which digital asset to click on and, but at the same time, not let this guy take the sign down. And finally, uh, I got the foot doctor on the phone and we go back and forth and back and forth. And apparently there might've been another doctor involved in this. And cause they kind of claim the sign was abandoned. Which day are you talking about? The Patels, the okay. owners of the quality Inn yeah. at sunset and Benton that want to, and, and, and they're saying that it was abandoned because, uh, Dr. Doctor Lim had, had already moved. left. Correct. Okay. But the community really had the vested interest in the sign. Absolutely. And the uh, idea that it should just be removed with no fanfare didn't make sense to me. I mean. And this is why you're a hero. The fun part is, is that the sign, you know, uh, actually means something. But the real problem here is that it's fucking, the hell mouth has been released. Nothing is in its place. We are going to suffer. People are going to be evicted. Homeless are going to be continue to be slaughtered on our streets. People are going to be killed. This sign, it protected that. Now, I can only hope that we have somehow suckered in the evil spirits behind where it currently is and that somehow or another the, you know, planet will be restored to order. But well, well the, the Dodgers did win the World Series. Yeah, but during COVID, that doesn't count. <laughs> You're saying that as a giant fan. No, I don't fuck fuck sports. You know, you don't have a lot of sports things in here. It's a fucking copyright scam. Who wants to support corporations? <laughs> Billy, you're the best, man. You're the best. But no, the, the negotiations in Shooter is pretty much a bum fight over the sign. <laughs> and everybody agreed, okay, we'll let him take it down. The guy removing the sign said he could bring it down safely. And then they would pass it to my possession, which is what happened. We monitored it. We uh, stood there. We didn't let him remove it from the premises and got a U-Haul and brought it here. That is so awesome. But it was a fun day. Did you see more foot traffic at EK once you got these guys in here? No, not so much, but we do have more merchandise. You We're do? the fucking Disneyland of the foot thing. But the main thing is I got my minister's license in order to perform ceremonies under the sign. Marriages, we have a foot ceremony that we're working on. Get uh, out but of like here. a foot bath. And we would like to do instant marriages under the sign. You know, both cup, parts of the couple put their feet in the bath and we <laughs> pronounce them man and wife. We'll do bar mitzvahs too. <laughs> Pet weddings are our specialty though. Do you think that, that Los Feliz has the right vibe for you? If you, if, 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 well, because it's Christmas, we have to pronounce it Los Feliz. Have you always pronounced it Los Feliz? No, only during Christmas. Because <laughs> it's Los Feliz Navidad. How do you feel about Los Feliz? Um, it's a neat area. Yes, it's like a, uh, you know, it's got an affluence. It's got a, it's kind of hidden. It's frankly a neighborhood you never know it even existed. I mean, who fucking ever heard of Los Feliz? It's not fucking Hollywood and it's not Silver Lake, but it's in the middle here and people apparently do know of it, even though I'm not very good on that. And you've been here 20 years. Well, I mean, you, I came here in the 80s, but 30 years, then. Uh, the store itself, I took over in 97. The store has been around L.A. since the early 80s. But you, it, I'm asking me. Well, in I mean, this, I, this, this is the longest city I've never lived in. You still don't feel like you're an Angelino? Hey, I live every, I I leave every two to three days. Do I get really? out, I get the fuck out, and then I come the fuck back. I like to be in two places at one time. <laughs> I woke up to the sunrise in Northern California, and I 
fucking it's all the sunset in Southern California. It's like Highway Five is my driveway. Let's change gears real quick because I do follow you on Instagram, and you have a very unique Instagram. Um, recently, you've been obsessed with Vernon. Love Vernon. <laughs> All of a sudden, a big smile has appeared on your face. Yeah, what I is can't it about Vernon? It. What is it about Vernon that uh, appealed to you? I can't believe it. <laughs> I can't believe that the largest part of Los Angeles has been cut out of its soul and is vacant. It's like a square, this uh, a place the size of Manhattan exists in this town with less than 100 residents. A road that was, I envision, named after John Fonte, Bandini, drives through it, and it's the best road in all of Los Angeles. You can drive 100 miles an hour down that road and burn your nostrils with the smell of compost at the same time till you're crying with the tears. Yet, there's a town that has... Less than 100 people in the middle of Vernon, a budget of $260 million with their own electric company. The LA River runs right through the middle of it. 60% of the products that the United States consumes goes through Vernon on train with an underground train system. Yet, no one even knows it exists. When did you learn that it existed? Well, one of my screen printers was in Vernon, and back in the 90s, I used to drive down there and work with him, and, you know, I just got to kind of see that it was his own town, yet it's the center of Los Angeles. It's the part of Los Angeles that people imagine Los Angeles is, which is the industrial factory Los Angeles, but it's not Los Angeles. And I drive 20 feet and I'm in Huntington Park and it's a city with like a cultural Latino fairs, stores, quinceanera dresses in the windows and a city street that looks like it's from the 1960s and houses and things. And then I cross over one street and it's a barren, empty, desolate, like, Space And I go, how can there be this much empty space in the middle of Los Angeles? But when you see that empty space, just like an artist, you see an empty canvas. You love it. It seems like it sparks your creativity and your imagination and it gets your heart pumping. Yeah, it's the anomaly that it exists that is like uh, crazy and I don't understand and therefore I go... There must be a reason why. There must be a payoff somewhere. There must be a benefit to having a recycling center in the middle of Los Angeles. I can't put my finger on it, but it's not civic pride. Do you want to move there? Would I move there? Yeah. I'd fucking, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> I'd fucking go down there. I I mean, I would march down there and build a house there. But can I do that? I can't right now because of my personal situation. But the fact that no one, you know, I mean, sadly, that's where, you know, you might need other people when it comes to a political thing uh, to support you. I mean, what would you do if you were living in Vernon? Would you run for office over there? Fuck, I'd destroy the government. I would just fucking, like, uh, it would be a city of anarchy. It would be... Why, why do you want to destroy this thing that you love? It's not that I love... I don't love the city government. I think it's it's the idea, I mean... It's the anomaly that you it love. It is the solution to many problems in Los Angeles. It is the perfect... It is the... Uh, who is John Galt of fucking Ayn Rand? It is an empty canvas in the middle of something that has been painted over every other way that we could think of. Nothing is permanent in Los Angeles. So to find an empty canvas in the middle of this fucking city is amazing. And to think, I mean, even the residents there, I don't know, uh, you know, I'm not, and I try to think of, well, 
why do I not think that their position matters? Because this is 100 years ago that this town was created. This isn't now. They live there. How, how come only 100 people live there? Because of the zoning laws. You're not allowed to build a house? You're not allowed to build an apartment building? Not at all. And the problem here is that if we don't do something about this, Amazon is going to fucking own that town. Amazon is on the outskirts of that town. Amazon is ready to fucking own that city. In my opinion. That's all I got. And, and like Inglewood... I don't know what happened to Inglewood. Well, they, uh, the mayor there is just excited to have any business. So when the Rams decide that they want to uh, uh, decimate Hollywood Park racetrack. Yeah, I remember that. He lets them. Yeah. Because all they care about is money. So if Amazon says we'll pay you triple what you, we it's a different situation. Inglewood is populated with actual citizens. Inglewood is an actual town. They do have an actual mayor. They might have a corrupt mayor, but they can vote that mayor out. We're not talking about that with Vernon. Vernon doesn't Vernon. have a mayor? They fucking had two recalls in the past year. They've thrown everybody out and thrown a new batch out. They fucking don't care. Who is that fucking guy? Fatty Arbuckle had a baseball team. They had a national baseball team in Vernon in the early 1900s because they were the only place that allowed people to drink during Prohibition. It's a clean slate. It's Las Vegas. It's fucking anything you want to do. It's a beautiful city. I want you to be the mayor of Vernon. It's not for me, man. You don't... I mean, I don't care. It's, it's about the fact that you could create everything people talk about creating. What would you create there? I think that the idea that you have a large budget already, they have their own electric company. They have a fascist police department. Do they? They have their own medical facilities. I would create a homeless city where you could then bring in and actually my calculations based on the density of the population per square mile is that you could house 50,000 homeless people in Vernon and that's exactly the number that they put on the homeless population in L.A., although Look at it's you. growing. So you would solve homelessness in L.A. if you were the mayor of Vernon? You wouldn't have to be the mayor of Vernon. You just allow Vernon to change its zoning policy by taking over Vernon, by populating Vernon with actual people and it's not that far away from skid row so skid row is in the shadow of city hall for a reason what's the reason the reason is that they are as close to the source of the problem as they can be i see, I see. and they for the city can't walk down there and deal with it but they can ignore it Largely, I think our purpose now is a little bit of like cultural heritage for Los Angeles in this in these areas. And yes, we find anomalies like Vernon and I get fixated on them. But the reality is that's a special area. But you wouldn't know until you dug into L.A. And L.A. has so many special little areas that I can't even put enough of the designs for L.A. in the store. So we cover some of them to stay in business, but that's kind of our fun place is like, you know, covering these areas. I mean, people come to me from Whittier and from other parts of Los Angeles to have these shirts made. I mean, Valley Village. God bless the, Valley Village. God bless Valley <laughs> Village. <laughs> you know, and I think that's kind of where, okay, at least we have some staying power if we could do that. Yeah. But, you know, I'm probably not the right person to run this store because, I mean, I get fixated on problems in my life like Vernon, and then <laughs> I will destroy the marketing 
ability of the store, but I do think it serves a purpose of providing, you know, a cultural outlet for, for, you know, I mean, shows that have been missed. Everything I've, I mean, we have people that make things for this store that I don't pay. They bring them in here. They buy the merchandise. They make it. They put it on the shelves. I don't price it. So it's you're, you're uh, kind of a hippie consignment shop. We would respect the uh, concept of a store that has no fees. It would be great. I mean, the problem is... You are an anarchist. It's not a... Yeah, if you had to, you know... But it's not It's not the... Uh, oh, oh, then let's the idea is it's for the, the better good. Do you believe in God? Which one? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Well, no. Why would I believe in God? Because here you are in the midst of frustration. What frustration? Of you're trying to figure out the image for this T-shirt. Oh yes. And it's and it and it's right in front of you. If it was a snake, it would have bitten you. Yes. I'm a crazy person. I th I think of okay, God is is looking out for me. Yeah. And he's like knucklehead. It's right there. Yeah. What I do you do think? Believe, I mean, I mean, okay. I'm gonna use the phrase. I don't know. The, uh, what's the word? Okay. I believe that you are, you manifest things, period. And as people have said, maybe I manifested this sign. I had made a mini version. I made a wheel. I made shirts. I mean, I manifested. I'm not saying I have that power to manifest it. The power is outside me. But that design did manifest itself. And just like maybe the original... Free James Brown did, but see, I hate to, I got to give credit to the original designs, the original motif, the original styles, and essentially, it's hard to say art history is important, but t-shirt history is, I mean, hey, come on already, where's, where do these, these, these things, because we're, we're working in a meme culture now. And that was a meme culture then, but things moved a lot slower. Now, is an iconic image, you know, what does it take to make an iconic image? Now, I moved from photography towards screen printing, but screen printing is a more consumable medium. Right. And when you add words to it, it somehow or another is more fun. But in this case, it timed up with an actual event and in a person, a personality. So Winona deserves credit. And I do think that the only reason that she was severely abused for her, you know, trying on merchandise is that 9-11 had happened a few months before. And because they were able to accuse her of shoplifting, it appeared anti-American because they were trying to encourage everyone in this country to spend money with corporations and fucking support corporations yeah. as if somehow that's going to save America from an onslaught of political like abuse. And so she became a, uh, you know, pariah of this like anti-shopping Scenario it when just, we should fucking destroy these rip off fucked up companies. When you say you love Los Feliz, what do you love? The people. It's the people, yeah. it's not the places. Uh, best best post office in, in all of oh, LA. Oh, absolutely. Being across the street from the post office is great. We, they're open late. They're yeah. open on Saturdays. Yeah. You ever eat any pies over at the House of Pie? I've had my share. The uh, I gained the first 20 pounds with <laughs> my ham and cheese in the middle of the night. You're, you're, you're a trim man. But, no, I've lost some of it lately. You know, keto. Intermittent fasting. But... <laughs> <laughs> you buy books over at the Skylight uh, Annex over there? I, I don't have time to, to necessarily shop. Yeah. All I'm saying is it's the people. The people are great. The yeah. You know, you don't know who's going to walk in one day to the next. True. I mean, 
I've worked for everybody from can't remember Leonardo DiCaprio. He's coming here. Got, I saved his childhood. I mean, I've got uh, <laughs> who else? I mean, just name them. I probably, Brad Pitt come in here. Brad Pitt, no. Ryan Gosling. Uh, that pretty boy, huh? I would have kicked him right out. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> But the problem is all the girls that worked for me were jealous because I got to meet him. <laughs> and it's like, I didn't know who he was. I just swiped his credit card. He bought a black velvet painting of Elvis one night. Really? Yeah, yeah. I still have one left, but it's not here now. He how bought about one. that? But, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, home improvement guy. I don't know. It's Tim like, Allen. Oh, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He used to come in here with his hot dates oh. and stuff. But, you know... Is he still married? I don't, I don't know. But <laughs> I think the, he got canceled. You know, Marty and Elaine, Marty, Marty used to come over here and hang out. He had a heart attack recently, like a year or two ago. Yeah. You know, I get to hang out with Marty and like shoot the shit. Well, Billy, I feel like we could talk all night and it would be incredible. I, I think we're, I think we're done though. Good. Because that's a whole nother story. <laughs> How great was Billy? You know who else we want to put on a t-shirt and tell them how much we love them? Our Patreons, who always bring us the Yuletide spirit. When you stoke us, you're saying, Tony, Jordan, here's a Christmas cookie. Here's some new twinkly lights. Here's a down payment on a condo in Vernon. Every donation you hand over helps us keep this insane project a rolling. So shout out to our Patreons, Nancy Rommelman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann, Barney Grinky, Ben Welsh, Henry Furman, Jen Adams, The Lonely Chair, Trevor Wilson, and Bree Wild. Want to hear your name at the end of next week's show? Go to patreon.com slash here in LA and give till it hurts. Also, shout out to our Angelinos. To be an Angelino, all you have to do is PayPal us 25 bucks or more, and we will list you on the Here in LA website forever. To be an Angelino, all you have to do is PayPal us 25 bucks or more, and we will list you on the Here in LA website forever. You will also be given a number to denote how early you got in to make this dream come alive. For example, Angelino number one is Allie Miller. Number two, George Wright. Number three, Rita Joanne. Four, Jason Sutter. Five, Grant Houghton. Six, Rob Baker. Seven, Kevin Cheng. And eight is Brenda Garcia. Just PayPal your hard-earned cash to busblog at gmail.com. Want to support us, but you're back in lockdown because your best friend's girlfriend didn't get a booster and now everybody you know is blah, blah, blah? You can still help. Post your favorite episode on your Facebook. Tweet something nice about us. Tell your friends. Tell all your friends. We've done 31 episodes. Do a little countdown of your top four. Tell them how Here in LA is spelled and that it's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Google. Here in LA is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and a man who's never been on Santa's naughty list, Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Original songs by Oregon and Jordan Katz. Special thanks to Cindy for creating the logo, Jen for inspiring this, and Lena Lacaro for encouraging me one more time to give Billy a ring. I will miss you, Los Feliz! Feliz. Feliz. Feliz.